Kathy Hunter. For more on uh, the murder journalist, we're joined by terrorism and security analyst Eric Steckelberg. Eric, welcome back to ClearCut. Always good to have you with us. Uh, Eric, uh, Great the, to be with you, Michelle. Good to have you, Eric. The, the, the latest account uh, from the Saudis here is that this was a, a rogue act. Some Saudi officials saying uh, that uh, Khashoggi died in a, in, in a chokehold after resisting uh, attempts to return him to Saudi Arabia. And all of that stressing that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman did not know anything about all of this. What is your take on this? Yeah, tough, tough to kind of sort it all out, Michelle. What really went on in that embassy? We still don't know. We know that Khashoggi is dead, without a doubt. It seems like the Saudis are changing their stories by the day. The Turks say they have an audio recording of what went down there and the murder. They say they have this audio recording, Michelle. They still have not released it. But what I'm concerned about, Michelle, is the larger picture here right. after Khashoggi's death. Namely, does this threaten that Sunni Arab alliance that the United States, the Trump administration has been building with Saudi Arabia really as the linchpin, the Saudis, uh, the UAE, the Gulf states aligned against that Iranian axis, Iran, the Assad regime, Hezbollah. Th that would be a tragedy for that to be a casualty right. here, Michelle, because we, the Trump administration has really been cultivating the Saudis, number one, in that regard against Iran. Number two, the Saudis have serious back-channel relations with Israel going on right now as well. Could this put that in jeopardy? To me, that's the big question. Yeah, there is certainly so much at stake here, to your point, uh, Eric, given how critical uh, the U.S.-Saudi uh, relationship is to, to the Middle East at large, Iran, uh, Israel, a number of uh, terrorism-related issues. So how should the U.S. handle this then? I mean, what do you think the correct response is? Yes, yeah, some have said uh, something similar, Michelle, to what was done to Turkey a few months ago, where certain important individuals inside the Turkish government were sanctioned. Perhaps that's the answer. Uh, the Saudis have to be held accountable for this in some fashion, because at the end of the day, Michelle, the Trump administration, again, has really banked on Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, as a reformer and their man in the Sunni Arab world to kind of lead that anti-Iran alliance. This is kind of an embarrassment to the Trump administration for this kind of act to go down inside Turkey. So there's got to be some kind of accountability there, without a doubt. Maybe, again, it's sanctioning certain individuals within that government. But at the end of the day, we can't push the Saudis away entirely, mm -hmm. Michelle, and blow up the whole relationship. That would be disastrous because, again, the main threat in the region, in the Middle East, a threat not only to the Sunni Arab states like Saudi Arabia, but to Israel and, yes, the United States, is the Iranian regime. Let's keep the eye on the ball right now. Iran is the major problem in the Middle East. And right now they are marching across the region. We need the Saudis to help counteract that Iranian Shiite axis. You know, Erica, you mentioned Iran, and, and it's curious to me the difference uh, in reaction that we're seeing from the international world. We have uh, German's Chancellor Angela Merkel, for one. Uh, she is now vowing to halt all uh, German arm exports to Riyadh until this is uh, cleared up, uh, speaking very vocally against this. Um, there's been intense international reaction condemning this, boycotting the uh, conference, uh, the Davos in the desert, as it's known. And this is the same Germany that's overlooking Iran's egregious human rights violations, are certainly not known for the way that they treat their journalists, uh, amongst other gross violations. Yeah. What do you make of this double it standard, that the international community is so quick to take action here and uh, dismissing other actors in the region, certainly Erdogan, who's got at least uh, reportedly 100 journalists jailed, and, and more significantly, Iran, Germany going out of its way to facilitate business and, and to bypass those sanctions uh, that the U.S. is trying to pose against Iran and taking such a hard line on this. Michelle, great point. Total double, st double standard. Number one, Erdogan, the Turkish government right now, who are being held, look, they're being held up as the paragon of virtue and truth by the mainstream media. He's the number one jailer of journalists in the world is Erdogan. Number two, you make a great point about the Iran nuclear deal. The mainstream media, uh, the EU, they're full cheerleaders uh, for the Iran nuclear deal, which emboldens, empowers, and enriches that Iranian regime, which is the world's number one state sponsor of terrorism, according to our own State Department. Mm -hmm. But now all of a sudden that's kind of brushed aside and, and the bullseye is on the Saudis. Look, the Saudis are not Boy Scouts by any yeah. means. We know that. 
But to me, the larger threat right now is that Iranian regime, and we need the Saudis as part of that Sunni Arab coalition, along with Jordan, Egypt, and the Gulf states. Uh, what comes after MBS and the Saudi regime right now could be a nasty thing. Who knows what comes next? Could it be something uh, uh, hard, even more hardcore, Wahhabi, uh, kind of Salafi sympathizer government, an Iranian puppet state? A lot of nasty scenarios with what could come after the Saudi royal family right now, especially with Iran continuing to yeah. loom. Uh, absolutely great points. And Eric, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the story, which of course is linked to uh, Iran. Iran, of course, uh, a sponsor of Hezbollah, the terrorist group. And Israel is saying that it has found another Hezbollah outpost near the Lebanese border with Israel that violates a UN Security Council resolution. Now, the post was presented as an environmental NGO. Israeli security forces say it is an observation post that monitors IDF operations. An IDF official says the terrorist group Hezbollah has armed men building military infrastructure there. And this is the sixth such position that Israel has identified within a mile of the border. Eric, uh, what's your take on this? What's Hezbollah's strategy? Uh, watchtowers, Michelle, and I've seen them up close, all of these watchtowers. They run from uh, Matula in, in northern Israel all the way down to the Mediterranean coast in Rosh Hanikra. These are literally along the Lebanon-Israel border, and they are literal watchtowers manned by Hezbollah very close to the Israeli border. And what Hezbollah is doing, look, number one, they're sending a message trying to intimidate and play some kind of psychological warfare against Israel. But number two, they are quite literally using these watchtowers to survey and surveil northern Israel. Look, Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, Michelle, has made a lot of noise over the past few years about a possible ground invasion or a ground incursion by Hezbollah into northern Israel when the next conflict comes. And imagine the propaganda victory that would be for Hezbollah to plant that yellow and green flag mm -hmm. in, in a northern Israeli village. Even if they only hold it for 10 minutes, the IDF comes and crushes them. Those images go throughout the world of a Hezbollah flag planted in northern Israel. Uh, that would be a nightmare scenario and a propaganda coup for Nasrallah. So to see those watchtowers, right. and that's what they are, Michelle, just miles or yards yeah. from the Israeli border, really, is very troubling. Yeah, no doubt about it. Eric, thank you so much. Eric Stackelback. Thank you, All right, Michelle. still ahead. Taking